If you don't want to die in the desert, you need survival skills. If you don't want to wander wildly in the wilderness, you need survival skills. If you want to walk out of the wasteland and into the promised land, you need survival skills. And life has its ha hazards, we all know that. If, if we want to survive, if we want to thrive, if we want to make it out alive, we need to have a certain set of skills. Now, maybe you know the words of that great philosopher, Napoleon Dynamite. It was he who said something like this, girls, they like guys who have skills, right? Nunchuck skills, bow hunting skills, computer hacking skills. Now those are, I'm sure, very important in life, but outdoor experts list a different set of three skills, survival skills that we need to make it through in life. And if you're taking notes, you might write these down, uh, the three P's of living through the wilderness. It's provision, path, and protection. Those three words right there. Provision, path, and protection. The first one, I'll elaborate on each just a little bit. Provision, you got the big two anyway, that's water and food. You're not going to make it long without those. And of course, we start to think if we're packing that we need a whole lot more than that. But really, water and food is uh, the provision there that is essential for life. Then you see a path. And if you're lost, of course, what you need to do is find your way. And, and really, that's what it is, navigation there, a way to find the way out of the wilderness so you don't just go around in circles all the time. And then you see the last one there, protection. That's a way to prevent injury, and if they do occur, and when they do occur, being able to treat those so that they do not escalate into life-threatening situations. Now, if you've ever been lost or stranded, you know that the very things that you take for granted one moment, as soon as you're lost, they can quickly become a matter of life and death. And one person put it this way. They said, everything in the desert, it either bites you or sticks you or stings you. And that's kind of a good description, of course, of the dangers of the desert, but it's also a pretty good description of life sometimes. You know, spiritually speaking, you can look at a lot of things and, and say, you know, everything in this world, it seems to either bite me or stick me or sting me or all three. And so God wants us here tonight to have spiritual survival skills and that's why he gave us his word as he did and so we're looking tonight at the book of numbers and it is really a story of survival and hopefully for us it's not just a dry dusty history lesson no in fact if you look at it correctly if we do you see that it describes in detail how to make it out of the wasteland and into the promised land and of course that should matter a lot to us as Christians you see the Old Testament has been called the picture book of God, God's picture book. And in here, of course, we see things sometimes painted as pictures. And the story of salvation, as we will see tonight, is beautifully woven through the story here in the wilderness. You see the message of Jesus, the life of Jesus, what he came to do and be right there into Jewish history. And so physically, as you may know, the Israelites, they were free the second they stepped out of Egypt, right? No longer under that cruel master, no longer slaves to sin, as you see that picture being painted. They were saved, you could say. But you know, it took them a whole long time to really enjoy that, to really enter into the fullness of all that God had for them. Yes, they were saved at that point out of Egypt, but there was a lot more work that God wanted to do and needed to do in their life. And so they were on their way to the promised land. And they needed to experience that freedom that God had given them in a point. Well, there was a process of them really coming to enjoy that. And many, as we've seen along the way, just died in the desert. They never really even saw and grabbed a hold of the promised land. And so that's what I call the saved soul but lost opportunity. And that can happen. Maybe you have different ways of thinking about it. The Bible sometimes calls it a carnal Christian. It's a person who has saving faith, but when you really look at it, not much more than that, and it never really goes beyond that really basic thing. They stay a baby their whole life, spiritually. And so you see what was true of them physically there can also be said of us spiritually. And this is really important for us to think through. When we put our faith in Jesus, of course, right there, we are saved. And we're out of Egypt, as it were, as you think of that picture there, and well on our way to the promised land. And what you see is that every Christian can count on at least some moments of misery, really. Some of those wilderness weeks or desert days or sometimes it even stretches on for whole eras 
of your life or seasons of your life that you say, man, this is just one of those wilderness times. But the important thing for us to highlight in our minds is this, that we were not meant to live in the wasteland. And we certainly weren't meant to die there. See, God wants us to have survival skills. And he shows us in his word how to do those things. You maybe remember those three Ps that I gave earlier. It's provision, path, and finally protection. And in Numbers 20, verse 1, we're going to see the first part of that. But as we go through these two chapters, we're going to see some key phrases that go along with each of those words. So here they are right up front if you're taking notes mentally or on your page. It's provision. The first one, talk to the rock. Provision, if you want to know where to get that, talk to the rock. The second one, path, take the highway. That's what we're going to see in this section here if you don't want to die in the desert. Then the last one, protection, it's going to be look and live. Some simple phrases there. Again, talk to the rock, take the highway, look and live. And we'll see each one of those in turn. Now, looking at it right away, talk to the rock. That's where it starts. Numbers chapter 20, verse 1. Read it with me and you'll see them needing some provisions. Now, I already mentioned water and food, of course. But not every need we have is physical. Isn't that true? We know that. Sometimes when we have those things met, we don't even think about them. But... You can think all the way through these chapters of the symbolic significance of each one of these things. Don't just be thinking physically. Apply these things spiritually to your life as we're meant to do. And so you see in verse 1 it says, The children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now I stop right away in the first verse, and you can see that Moses and Aaron had dealt with a lot of deaths during their time in the desert. But I believe that their sister's death here probably hit them very hard. And Miriam was watching over Moses. If you think about how long they had been around each other, all the way back when Moses was a nobody, he was just a baby floating along in a basket in the Nile River. And there was Miriam, his older sister. And so they had lived now out about 120 years together, that kind of thing. And you think about it, of course, we have three kids and they love to hate each other and they hate to love each other and all those things. But deep down, I know they like each other. They're not going to admit it, but you can see and you know that they do. And I love my sister, even though we loved, again, to fight and all those things. But you see that for 120 years, you had these three amigos, right? You had uh, the three stooges, more like maybe sometimes. But you had Moses and you had Aaron and you had Miriam. But now you just got Moses and Aaron, just two. Moses and Aaron, I'm sorry. And so what happened, of course, would have brought sadness to their hearts, but it's not just what happened, it's where it happened. See, if you look at the words of the Bible sometimes and think on them, Kadesh. Kadesh is an interesting place. We've seen it before. You may remember it. It's the exact spot where they had been told by God, hey, you're not going into the promised land. Right there in Kadesh. They're right on the border of blessings, and this was back in Numbers 14, and the Thief of unbelief came in and stole it right out from under him, and they had the rug pulled out from under him. They didn't get to go in from Kadesh, even though they could have seen the promised land right from there. And so now they've made a 40-year sandy circle all the way around, and they're right back where they started, except now, of course, 40 years older, and Miriam even dies and is buried right there in that spot, that place of failure. And so you see her, again, stopping short of the promised land. Now, Again, I, I want to make it very, very clear as we go through these things, just so no one misunderstands. This doesn't mean that she didn't go to be with God eternally after she died, just because she died short of the promised land. Uh, the promised land is a picture of the promised life. It's not uh, heaven. Heaven is something uh, far better than even Canaan, that's for sure. But Canaan was a place that was the full blessing of God that would come from their obedience and walk of faith in their lives. And so they could stop short of that and still be a saved person just like we can in our lives. And so what you see here is uh, Moses and Aaron, they are mourning Miriam. Now, what happens at this low point in their life? You would think maybe some of the people of, of Israel would understand the problems that they were having and maybe just for once think about uh, someone other than themselves. But that's not what happens. You see, instead of a sympathy card, Moses and Aaron get a complaint letter. Verse 2, it says, Now there's no water in the congregation. And so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we died with our brethren who died before the Lord. And so they're talking about this and saying, Man, we wish we had died a long time ago. Now, here's what's interesting. Again, 40 years had passed, and so this is really a new generation. If you get the timeline of 
the book of Numbers, what you're going to see is right now, it's coming to the conclusion of that 40-year judgment time where it was kind of like, hey, you're not going in. But a new generation gets to go in. So this is the new generation, really, right at the end of the old generation, last few dying off, and there's the same old complaint, you see, with a new group. It's kind of like deja vu all over again for him. And you see him saying, you know what? This has been the theme of every nightmare since I came out to the wilderness. I can picture Moses kind of waking up in the night with a bunch of people going, water, 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 you know, and empty water bottles and sand in them and everything. And he's like, I, I just can't get away from it no matter what I do. And so you see verse 6, a good thing that he does do with his brother there. He says, Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly of the people there to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Now, sometimes people ask, will we be able to recognize people in heaven? Well, I know at least two people that you will right away be able to recognize. Who's that? Moses and Aaron. They will be the two guys with the flat faces. They will be the two guys with their nose squished like this. Why? Because it always says in the Bible that every time people would hassle them, they would go fall on their face before the Lord. And that's really just a way of saying, hey, they were praying. They were asking God, oh God, please give me the patience to deal with this situation. The provision, again, that dryness that's going on in their lives, it's more than just, of course, that physical thirst. It's, it's an emptiness that they were having, and they always looked to Moses. You know, Moses, you're the problem. Every time something would go on, so often people do that. They look to people for the problem. They look to people for the provision, when in fact you see God is the provision. And so you see Moses and Aaron at least getting it right so far. And God's glory appears, and you see in verse 7 what the Lord says to Moses. He says, take that rod you got there, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together and speak to the rock before their eyes. And again, I made it rhyme a little better, talk to the rock, but it's the same idea. It says, before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Now, it says, you will bring out water for them from the rock and give drink to the congregation and to their animals. And so... Moses took the rod from before the Lord as God had commanded him. Now, verse 10, it says, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. They're going to have a rock concert here. And he says to them, Hear now, you rebels! Must we bring this water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and he struck the rock twice with his rod, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Now, you think about it right here. What you see is God's grace in provision, right? Water came out abundantly, just like God had promised it would. But there's a problem along with the provision, and you saw it there. God calls Moses and Aaron kind of in for a little conference. Hey, Mo, <coughs> Curly, <laughs> or whatever, Aaron, the two stooges who are left, what did I say to do? Talk to the rock. And what did you do? I talked to the people. No, actually, I yelled at them. Okay, I yelled at the people, and then I hit the rock twice. And God says, that's right, Moses, that's what you did. And because of that, no promised land for you. Now, verse 12, you read and see, it says, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, says, because you didn't believe me, to hallow me, that means to respect me, to honor me, in the eyes of the people, the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the assembly into the land which I've given to them. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I talk to the rock. As I'm reading the Bible, sometimes I look at things and go, you got to be kidding me, God. I know this is your word, and I know it's true, but you got to be kidding. I mean, isn't this a bit harsh? Isn't this a bit unfair? I mean, come on. Moses is in mourning, right? I mean, we just saw that. His sister died. And he's got this constant pressure from the people. Haven't you been reading it? They're just bugging him, bugging him. I mean, he's thirsty, too. And they're bothering him for water. And one little temper tantrum, just one little thing, just bink, bink, you know, you little rebels. I mean, I could have thought of a lot of the worst things he could have called them. And you know what? He, he doesn't get to go into the promised land. He doesn't get to lead them into the promised land. And if I had been Moses, frankly, I mean, let's be honest here, after all, I might have just hit the people with the rod of God. Just eliminate the middleman, right? Just give me that rod and nah, 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 you know, come and get them. Forget the rock. You know, we will, we will rock you, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But you got to remember, as I said before, that the Old Testament is 
God's picture book. And there is a very important picture. And the reason God reacts as he does and makes such a pronouncement here is because there's a lesson that we need to learn that is way bigger than Moses. See, it's an Old Testament picture here of a New Testament principle that we're going to see and apply to our lives here tonight. And to understand the story, we actually have to go a little bit back in the books of Moses, back to Exodus 17. Now, I don't recommend you go there because it's really the same thing, and I'm just going to tell it to you real quickly. You'd barely get there and back in time. But it's a very familiar scene. In fact, you could probably fill in a lot of the dialogue. The people are complaining. Uh, Egypt was better. The, uh, it's real dry out here. We don't like this manna, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. And we want water. And God tells Moses, look, I'll tell you what. Go strike the, wa strike the rock. He doesn't say talk to the rock. He says strike the rock once and water will come out. Now, all these years later, Numbers 20 rolls around. And God says, hey, now just talk to the rock. You don't have to strike the rock. Just talk to the rock and water will come out. Now, all throughout Scripture, again, the metaphor of a rock is used to describe God, his character and his nature, solid, stable, strong, and of course people uh, much the opposite much of the time. And so you see also that the Bible even comes further and says that the water from the rock was a picture of Jesus and what he came to do. Now, you don't have to take my word for it, you can take God's word for it, which is a better thing you see in 1 Corinthians 10.4, if you write that one down, 10.4. Good buddy. 1 Corinthians 10.4, it says, All drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And it says that rock was Christ. Now, whenever I read that scripture, I have this picture, you know, kind of of one of those cartoon things where there's a rock and the feet come out of the bottom of it and it runs. But that's really not what it's saying here. It's saying, you know, that rock that in every place Moses was having to strike the rock or talk to the rock or all the rest of that and water would come out and meet their need. Hey, that was a picture of of Jesus and what he came to do. And so God's painting a picture here and he says, strike the rock once and after that just talk to the rock and your needs will be met. And so Jesus here, he was struck at the cross just to make it as clear as we can here. The rod of God, what is that? The wrath of God upon Jesus and the result, well, provision in our lives. Water comes from the struck rock and the water all throughout the scripture is the sign of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the thing that is going to be fulfilling and filling that drink that we need, the spiritual drink that we need. And so you see that, and Moses messes up the picture. He's supposed to be the brush and in God's hand as he's painting this picture, and Moses kind of messes it up, he kind of does his own thing. He strikes the rock, not once, but twice, and he yells at the people and everything else and calls them rebels. And Of course they were. But he's really rep misrepresenting God's grace and goodness in this moment here. And he takes the credit even. You see that kind of sharing the glory. Must we do this? See, if I talk to a rock and water comes out, you know it's God. If I hit it, you figure, oh, well, there was a pipe under there or something like that, you know. But Moses' mis mistake here doesn't keep God from pouring out his provision abundantly. And I think that's important. But Moses' mistake kept him out of the promised land. It kept him in the wasteland, as you see in his life. And again, you think of the spiritual significance of that in our own lives. Well, Moses, of course, is an important man in the Bible. And he's a representation of a whole era, really. The law, the Mosaic law. The Bible uses him sometimes synonymously for that, saying this is what Moses came to do. And he had a purpose. He had a reason that God sent him. And he sends the law through Moses, the Ten Commandments. But this is so important. The law can never take us into the promised life. There's a lot of people who think, man, if I get a long enough legal list, I can somehow have this life that God wants for us. No, it's not found there. It's found when we talk to the rock, when we have a relationship with the rock of Jesus Christ, not some kind of list out there somewhere that's going to be the thing that does it for us. And so you see the law, that's the flaw in the law. Not that the law has a flaw, but that we have a flaw and we fall short because even a man like Moses blows it and he doesn't get to go into the promised life. Now, we might think to this point again, if we misunderstand the pictures, oh, he's not saved. No, he is saved. But he's not a guy who's going to get to enjoy all of the privilege and all of the blessing that God could have had in his life 
because of this disobedience. And now you see something very important as the story progresses. We'll get there eventually, but you'll see the book of Joshua. If you know your Bible, you keep going there, and eventually there is a guy who does take them into the promised land. What you may not know right away is that Joshua is the Hebrew form of a Greek name that you'll definitely recognize, which is Jesus. So Joshua, Jesus, those are the same names. Coincidence? I think not. And so you see, in John chapter 1, 17, we just studied it recently, it says that the law came through Moses and it had a purpose. But then truth and grace come through Jesus Christ. And so the law, of course, had its purpose and it predicts, even in these books of Moses, the gospel as you see it here tonight. And so the promised life, you can't do it on your own. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You can just believe it and receive it. That's the great thing about it. It's by grace. It's by faith. And so the rock was struck once, but never again. Just talk to the rock, and out will flow the living water that we need in our lives. Now, some would say, hey, that's really in interesting theology there. Um, you know, just got some insights into it or whatever. But how does this work practically and personally in my life? I mean, I can know all that stuff, and the bottom line is I'm still dying in the desert right now. I mean, right now, if you were to look at my life, it's dry, it's empty, it's got problems, I've got all these things going on, and I would still come back to that very simple little phrase that I leave with you tonight, which is, talk to the rock. Talk to the rock. Let him be that in your life. Build your life on the rock of Jesus for real. Don't just know some of these things in your head. Put your whole heart upon that and talk to the rock, and God's provision will come out abundantly in your life. I know it will because I know it has in my life. Now, as I think about that, I just want to share a little part of my own testimony and own experience in life. And this one's kind of a, a recent one in a sense. But it was in January of 2002 that we first moved from Miami down to Homestead. That's where we live right now. And the reason we did that was to plant a Calvary Chapel there. At, at just a year after this church was planted, we planted a church down in Homestead. Now, we live right by the Homestead Miami Speedway, and uh, it's, it's a massive stadium if you've ever seen it down there, and they have NASCAR races and they have Indy races. And, you know, when we first moved to Homestead, of course, I had all kinds of crazy dreams and thoughts and all this sort of things. And, and I was only half joking. I said to God, you know, that stadium looks like a great place for Calvary Chapel Homestead to meet. I mean, yeah, you got plenty of parking, you got about 65,000 seats, which probably... You know, we could go to two services if we needed to and stuff and, and, and things like that. But we never actually needed to, those 65,000 seats down there. But over the years, as we were down there, it was a great time in our lives. But I would often look at that huge stadium and all the people who would come to those races, and I would say, Lord, wouldn't it be great if, if that kind of thing could go on in such a way that God you would be the center of the attention? Wouldn't that be cool? I would talk to The Rock, you know, just like I do, just like you do, hopefully. And, you know, in a way, I kind of modified things over time, but I, I sort of said to the Lord one day as I was down there, hey, you know what, just once, I would love to just stand in that stadium and tell people about you, Jesus. If you'd just give me that chance, I'd take it. You know, I think that would be really, really cool. Now, some of you would say that's a ridiculous request. I certainly think it is. I, sometimes I ask crazy things of the Lord. And the easier, even crazier thing is that not only do I talk to the rock, but I believe the rock talks back to me. And so... I had this sense, and if you're a Christian here tonight, you know what I'm talking about, when you just had that sense that God said something, and he said, Scott, you will. Now, I'm being totally transparent here as much as I can. I try to do that in my life. And you know what? I had, until recently, very much given up on that promise. I had written that off as one of those, okay, that was just the crazy part of you. And so, you know, here's what happened. 20, 2005, it was a very difficult year for our family, actually. Very discouraging year for our family in some ways. And what happened is that the church that we had planted down there was uprooted. And it was a variety of reasons, but really at the end of the day, it was just what the Lord was doing. Now, we lost our lease. We had many doors shut in our face and all that kind of thing. And what we ended up doing is merged in here uh, into this fellowship here. Now, it's nothing at all against the fellowship here. This has been a wonderful time. It's just what I'm saying is back then, it was a time when I really honestly felt like a failure. It was kind of an emotional wasteland time in my life. And I'm sure you've had them. Maybe you're having one now. I don't know. But 
Sometime or another in your life, you'll go through one of these times where you just can't figure out what God is doing. And it was one of those times like that, you know, where I was like, God has failed me, I've failed God, or both, I don't know what's going on, but I had dreams, I had things that I thought would happen, and they've died, or they've gone this way. And I was just kind of going through that drought of doubt. And thankfully, the people here really have just breathed new life into our lives here as even the uh, name of the church is here. But I've been there, and I know you've been there, and we know what it's like, okay? So here's what, what really talking with the rock is all about in life, is that even when you're hurting like that, even when you're down, you still talk to the rock. You still have him as the rock in your life. And, you know, this is the thing, that when you do that, over time, you'll see God provides abundantly, and he does do what he says he will do. And as many of you know, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I actually had the opportunity to say the opening prayer at the Indy race at the Homestead Speedway down there. Now, I say that uh, because, wow, I was as shocked and surprised as any of you. And many of you have asked and said, hey, how did it go? And I'm like, well... Uh, I'll let you decide. What I did is I'm going to share the, the video of it. And it's hilarious that I even have the video of it because it wasn't supposed to be on TV. It wasn't supposed to be televised. And I'm going to tell you some of those details because they're amazing. And they just show that, the you know what? I talk to The Rock. He talks to me. And he loves me just like he loves you. And these are things that we need to remember. And even the crazy things that mean something to us that maybe we think God's forgotten that prayer and that one's all dusty and rusty in a corner somewhere. Hey, he may even answer that one sometime soon. So here's the thing. I got there at about 5 p.m. That's when they asked me to show up. And I looked at the itinerary, and the pre-race, which is what I was a part of, began at 7.30. Okay, 7.30 p.m. Now, it specifically said that the prayer was at 7.43, 7.43 p.m. And the televised portion began at 8 o'clock p.m. So what I did, I got on the phone, and I said, Hey, Mom, uh, you know, moms are moms. And I said, Hey, Mom... Um, <laughs> Sorry to tell you, it's not going to be on TV. It's not going to be on TV. You know, the 7.43 is when I'm doing the part, and they've got it all timed down to the second and all that kind of stuff. And so the prayer won't be on TV. Yeah, I'll just have to tell you about it later. And so as I'm standing there waiting and thinking about these things, I'm talking to The Rock. Let me tell you, I'm nervous. You know, I don't, don't think that you have this idea that I'm like, oh, man, yeah, I'm going to talk to the multitudes. I'm like, D God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I mean, I, know, I can't. You know, it's scary sometimes to pray in a restaurant, and I'm going to pray in a stadium in front of people. I prayed more for this thing. And not only that, but they said, look, it's got to be 45 seconds. I'm like, 45 seconds? What a, what's that? Uh, God bless America. Amen. You know? And so... I'm thinking, 45 seconds, I don't know if I can do that. Then they came to me and said, it's got to be 25 seconds. And I go, oh, talk to the rock, talk to the rock, talk to the rock, whatever. Guess. So here's the thing. I'm waiting, and I'm standing next to the mayor of Homestead, okay? His name's Roscoe Warren. So I'm standing next to him. It's the first time I met him. Never met him when I was the big, important pastor down there, uh, you know, but... <laughs> But now I'm meeting the, now I'm meeting the mayor and, and also a guy from Homestead Hospital, you know, and, and he's there and he's going to get one of those big cardboard checks, you know, that they have that hospital's opening soon. So we got, as I put it, the mayor, the payer, and the prayer. And that's what we got sitting there. So as I'm sitting there and talking to The Rock, guess what happened? A rain cloud came out over the field. Now, this is not a good thing for the race, but it's a good thing for the story because here's what happened. The, it just dumped water just really hard. I mean, like even vertical for a, a few times. You know, that thing where, or horizontal, where it goes like this. And then it went away. It was like a little hurricane came through the, the place. And so the event organizer came over to me and said, hey, there's a delay. They got to dry the track. And we're going to have to shorten the pre-race. And I'm like, Whew, they're going to cut the prayer. I know it. And so she turns to the mayor and says, sorry, mayor, we don't have time for you. I'm not kidding. She says, sorry, mayor, we don't have time for you. Then she turns to the guy with the big cardboard check and says, I'm sorry, we don't have time for your stuff either. And I'm waiting for uh, and the three, three outs and you're out. But they didn't. They said, all right, Scott, get on down to the track. You got 25 seconds. So I, I told my mom later, you know what? Only God could do this. They cut the mayor, they cut the payer, and they kept the prayer. <laughs> so here's what you're going to see. Is a... And now, will you please remain standing and welcome Pastor Scott Clunch of Calvary Chapel in Kendall as he offers today's invocation. Let's pray. Father God, since we are surrounded by such a great crowd here in Homestead, 
We take the time to pray for your protection for the drivers and for your blessings upon their family and the fans, the kids and crews here today. And we thank you for the freedom that we enjoy here in this great country and for those who have sacrificed and served to make it possible. And God, as we each have our, eat, our own race to run, we pray that we would fix our eyes on the example of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again to give life to those who believe. And we pray in his name. Amen. But this is what's so cool. I don't know if you know this. You know, I've watched it about 6,000 times. <laughs> Not that I'm vain or anything, but... It's funny, I said, oh, thank you, Lord. They showed my good side, you know, the top of my head. I, I was like, you know, so scared. But what's funny is the minute I say Jesus Christ, the guy looks at his thing like, man, there's something wrong with this thing. I could have sworn I just heard Jesus Christ through the thing. So anyway, this is what's funny about it as I think about it. Some of the things that happened this way. The stands were virtually empty at 743. But guess what? By the time this prayer was given, they were full because it was late. Right? And everyone shows up late. And my wife and a bunch of the ladies here were praying for this prayer. And for the prayer that day. And my mom was in Colorado. And I think that's really the swing vote right there. My mom was fervently praying that somehow, some way, that this prayer would end up on the air. She's like, just some way. And you know what? Because of that rain delay, as we talked to the rock, the water came out of that rock. And you know what happened? Not only heard in Homestead, but on ESPN, you think about that. Did it change anybody's life? I don't know, but it changed mine. I know that much. It helped me see, you know what? Even those dusty, rusty prayers, God cares about those things in my life. And so God's people talk to the rock, and it still happens today. Water pours out in abundance. That's the provision. Now we talk to the rock. That's a way out of the wasteland in our life. And you know what? It's not just that. There's the second of the three Ps that I share with you tonight, and that's path. And that's, you need to know where you're going when you're in the wasteland. Nothing is worse than not having any idea what the way out or where you've been or where you're going. And just that aimlessness and that endless sin cycle that can go on in people's lives. And you see, one of the survival skills we need to get out of the wasteland and into the promised land, this is it. Right here, it's a path. And the phrase that I shared with you to tie to that is take the highway. Take the highway. And you'll see this in verse 17. As you look at chapter 20 with me, it says, Please let us pass through your country. This is the Israelites talking here. It says, We will not pass through the fields or the vineyards, nor will we drink water from the wells. We will go along the king's highway. And it goes on and says, Hey, we're not going to mess up your land. We're not going to do anything bad. And then this bad guy named Edom says, Man, forget it. You're not going through my land. You'll have to go around. And if you try, I'm going to cut you down. And then you see in verse 19, they ask again, kind of pretty please, come on. We're just going to go through. We're going to go through quickly. We won't eat anything. We're not going to drink anything. Uh, if we do, we'll just get it out of the rocks. It's no big deal. And he says, you know what? You're not passing through. And if you do, I will come out, you, out at you with a strong hand. And what ends up happening is they have to turn and go a different way. Now, again, I think... It's important to put ourselves in this picture and let the Bible get really personal. What looked like a great path to them, to the promised land, it's right there in front of them. And it's called the King's Highway. Now, this is an earthly king, of course, as named after. But the Israelites here, they're coming through as the inhabitants and asking them of a, just a little favor. Hey, could we just, we're in real need. You know, it says we're in, we're, we've had a hard time, guys. I mean, we're really tired and it would just be really nice to take a little shortcut if we could. And instead of a helping hand, what they get is kind of that old thing of, hey, talk to the hand. Edom says no with a sword and in a strong hand. And this response is really hard to take, I'm sure. Why? Because they were family. Really, that's what they were. They should have been friendly. See, Edom is actually a descendant of Esau. And you see Jacob, that's Israel. And so these are the same forefathers here. It even ties their history together. And in verse 14, he specifically says, hey, brothers, let us through. I mean, this is family. And can we talk about that just as personally as we do? You know, it's funny. It's safe to say in a, a room this size that many of you are veterans, maybe even casualties of civil wars. Family feuds can cause some of the most painful wounds in our lives. And a brother, a sister, a parent, a child, a spouse, an ex, a former friend, all of those things has a capacity to hurt us maybe like nobody else can. 
And you think about what's happening here. They're just coming to him with a reasonable request. They're kind of down, and they're looking for somebody to just help them a little bit. A reasonable request. All I want to do is pass through in peace. I'm not looking to cause any problems. And what happens is they say, oh, you want to come through in peace? Well, we'll cut you to pieces if you do. Now, what are the survival skills they need at this point? Well, you might think, again, those nunchuck skills. Yeah, bow hunting skills. That's what I need. Even some computer hacking skills or something. No. Guess what we need here? We need the path. The proper path that we see here, again, I, I tied that phrase to it, take the highway. That's what you see in here. Them saying, hey, we'll stick to the highway. We'll stick to the highway. And that's in contrast, in my mind, to the low way. And there's a low way, of course, and the temptation here would have been to do that, to lower themselves to the level of these people who were treating them like they were, fighting fire with fire, you know, and saying, all right, well, if you're going to be bitter toward me, I'll be even better bitter toward you. I'll be even more of what you are and twice as much and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? God's word is saying, hey, don't do that. Don't do that. There's a highway, and that's the only way out of the wasteland. Sometimes we think, oh, the way out of this wasteland, I'm going to waste that person. Say, no, that would be a waste. That would truly be a waste. Take the highway, God's path of peace, wherever possible. Is it always possible? No. We're going to see that they even go into some conflicts at different times. But here's the thing. They're letting God pick their path. And sometimes Israel would turn their cheek and turn around and just go the other way. And it's better to go the long way, if it's God's way, than the wrong way even if it's the short way. And so the survival skills there, that path that's taking the highway, you'll like where it leads in your life. And where it leads as well, you'll see it in verse 26. You see there that Aaron, well, as he is dying, it says that he's gathered to his people. He's going to be gathered to his people. And he's taking that high road. And you think about it, the death of Aaron, well, of course, that is a sad thing in some ways. And there's even an element of discipline in what's happening here if you read it closely. But there's also a gentleness to it. You see a gracefulness that God is doing, a dignity here to the high priest, Aaron, the first high priest in the Scripture. And you see God leading Aaron to a, a high hill here, and he transfers his priestly garment over to his son. And again, that phrase that I kind of locked on there is gathered to his people. Who were his people? Well, one of his people is... Miriam, right? Remember her, his sister? She just died earlier in the chapter. And now Aaron dies, and so he's gathered to her. Gathering to God means also being gathered to God's people. And Aaron had godly parents, Aaron and Moses and all that, and you see them dying a long time before. But this big family reunion that goes on, being gathered to his people. And again, I think it should be obvious to us by now, if it's as we, see, as we are seeing this, that the promised land's not a picture of heaven. Again, we have an, yet another really godly person staying this side of the promised land. Moses didn't make it to Canaan. We already saw that. Miriam didn't make it. Aaron didn't make it. A whole generation didn't make it. But yet, that generation, that group there, well, they were saved in the scripture. That's what you see. All three of them here that we talked about, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, will surely be in heaven. Again, the folks with the flat faces. But taking... Time to address something that is so important because many Christians get really troubled over this. And so I just want to take some time. I was talking with someone even this week about it. And I just want to take some time publicly to address what I've seen a very troubling issue for some people. People come to Christ. They realize that Jesus is the way. Again, we're talking about this path. He is the way, the truth, the life. There is no other way to get to God except through him. And that's a truth that is never going to move. And a person can get real overjoyed about that. And then all of a sudden, this weird thought comes to mind. And they start thinking, well, wait a minute now. I've had friends and family who aren't Jesus freaks like I am now. And I, I wonder what happened to them. And all of a sudden, that person is going from the joy of knowing Jesus to getting really, really worried about something they can't do anything about. Did this person go to heaven or not? And you know what? At the end of the day, the Bible doesn't really say about a lot of individuals whether they did or didn't. I've had people ask me that along the way. What about this guy? What about that guy? What about just picking people out of the Bible all over there? What happened to this guy? What happened to this? Some are very, very, very obvious. Some, well, we don't know until we get there. And so here's the thing. You might be thinking my grandmother or my grandfather or my aunt or my brother or whatever, my, this friend, you know, somebody who died early in my life or whatever. Well, listen to this very closely and think it through with me. Jesus is the only way to salvation. But the knowledge of that fact in your life shouldn't give you less confidence in the lives of others, but more. 
whether they're living or dead, think about this. What happens? What happened in your life? What happened in my life when we came to know him? He gave us amazing grace. I mean, when I think about what God has done in my life, it's, it's just hard to even fathom the depths that he had to go to do that. And so the more I know about Jesus, the more confident I become, not only in my loved ones here in this life, but the ones who have already gone. And I have every expectation to be gathered to my people. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not making some kind of statement that there's universal salvation. I'm not making that. That's not the point of what I'm saying here. I'm trying to say that, you know what? Coming to faith in Jesus gives us confidence in all of these areas to where we can even say, hey, I just trust this to the character of God. I grieve, but not as one who has no hope. I have more hope to see them now that I know Jesus. Not less. It makes no sense to have it the other way. God does not want us going through life worrying about the dead. He wants us to focus on our life and the lives of the living. And so salvation is by grace through faith in Jesus. And guess what that means? There's going to be some real surprises. There's going to be some real surprises. There are going to be some people with shocked looks when they see you. <laughs> there are. There's going to be, what? What? What are, you, well, what are you doing here? Well, I didn't know. Well, I didn't know. And so, gathered to his people. I love that phrase. It's such a cool phrase. Now, all that said, take a lesson from Aaron and these others who stopped short of what God could have and would have done in their life had they only believed him. And there's no reason to ever leave a question mark hanging over your life. See, I think that's one of the saddest things you can do to the people who love you. Leave them with a question mark over, their, over your head. What was that guy's life all about? See, I hope your life is lived with an exclamation mark over it. That guy's all about Jesus, and there's no question where they are today. And so the greatest gift, I think, sometimes that you can leave your loved ones is not necessarily a financial one, but a spiritual one, which is that you leave no doubt in your wake when you're gone. Now, chapter 21, we look at the last of these three words here, protection. This is really important. Protection, it talks about looking and living. Looking and living. Now, what's fascinating, we wish we were this smart, but we're not, at least I'm not, maybe Pedro is, but he's going to teach on this section in the New Testament on Sunday, and we could not have figured that out if we had spent all our lives trying to figure it out, but God figured it out for us, so that's a great thing. But what you see is verse 1 through 3, just quickly summarizing, God gives them a victory, and, and then right away they're back to their old tricks. I don't know if you've ever felt that way in your own life. It's like, yay, boo. Well, that's what happens. Verse 4, they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out here in the wilderness? There's no food, no water. You know the story that they give. And it says, our Soul loathes this worthless bread. Isn't it funny how flawed their logic is? There's no food and we hate this bread. Well, what is that? It's food, but we hate it. Okay, so they're discouraged. And anytime you're discouraged, what that means is you're lacking courage. That's what the word means. And so you see them fearing, not faithful. And so verse 6, it says, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. And therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord, talk to the rock, that he'd take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who's bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And so Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bit anyone, when that person looked at the bronze serpent, they lived. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of the chapter 21, but just summarizing it, you'll see it there in verse 10, a couple of words that are real important. They moved on. They moved on. Israel moved on. And that's good. You'll see if you read the rest of the chapter when you get home and we'll study some of the things subsequent. They moved on past their defeats, past their problems here. They began to win. Small victories, but some significant ones in their life. They're suddenly singing songs about water, spring up a well, and all this kind of stuff. And they're kind of, you know, they're, things are looking up. And it's all because they learned these survival skills as we go through them. Provision, talking to the rock, they were doing that. Path, taking the highway, getting back to it when they got off of it, and protection, looking and living. 
And before long, we'll see this group of people out of the wasteland and into the promised land. Now, again, thinking about these survival skills, I do want to talk for just a moment about the meaning of this little parable here. And it's not a parable, really. It's just a story, a physical story with a spiritual understanding. And you see survival skills here. Jesus mentions in here, and, and, and what it means, this. He, he mentions this story in the Old Testament. And that even in our lives, if we may experience the wasteland for a little while, we don't have to live there and we don't have to die there. It doesn't have to be the characteristic of our life. That final skill that we talked about, survival skill, protection. It's knowing how to avoid injury, but also how to recover and how to have a remedy. Now, this is an admittedly very strange story, right? You've got uh, a bunch of snakes, deadly s snakes, and, and God says, okay, here's the solution. Stick a bronze snake on a pole and look at it and you'll live. Now, imagine looking this up in a hurry in a first aid book, you know? Somebody gets bitten by a snake, get it out. Okay, here's what we're saying. Make a bronze snake. Anybody got any bronze? Make a bronze snake, stick it on a pole and look at it and everything will be fine. You go, uh, okay, get another book. <laughs> How could looking at a brass serpent on a pole do anything for you? How do you explain that? Well, there is no natural explanation, of course, for it. I think the best explanation is the super, supernatural explanation that Jesus gives, and it's in John chapter 3, verse 14 through 15. It's the prelude to probably the most well-known scripture in all of the world, which is John 3, 16. But right before that, there's kind of an obscure little statement that some people read it and go, whatever. What about the snake on the pole? I don't know. And so we're going to know after tonight. It says, John 3, 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent, in the wilderness, even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's talking about his crucifixion there. He says that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. See, Jesus makes it real clear what we need for survival skills is protection. And so simple the way the Bible makes it. Look and live. I love how God makes it so simple. Even a child can understand it. Moses put a snake on a pole and those who looked at it lived. And those who didn't died. Nobody had to explain it or, or have a reason for it. It's just the way it was. God said, this is what it is. Take it or leave it. And so God, in the same way, puts his son on a cross, and whoever looks at his son in faith will live. And the snake is a picture of Jesus there, and the pole is a picture of the cross as we see those parallels. And God put his son on a pole, and he says, look and live. Now, some would right away say, hey, I don't like you calling Jesus a snake. That's a bad thing. Jesus isn't a snake. No, he's not. We are. That's the whole issue here. See, God put our snakiness on his son. He put my sin on his son and then stuck his son on the pole. And you see the bronze there is the metal of judgment in the scripture. And so it's a judgment of his sin. God made him who knew no sin to become sin. For us, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. And so there was one remedy for that problem. There were a lot of snakes, and you can be bitten by a lot of things in life, you know, a certain brand of sin and all the rest of that. But listen, there's one solution, one remedy, and time is of the essence when you've been bitten. It's not a thing they say, well, let me see how this progresses and see what happens. And I think it's so important, again, just to point out a couple of the little things Moses didn't say. God didn't say to him, hey, Moses, grease that pole. And whoever can climb up to the top of that pole and touch that snake, ding, you know, that person will be saved. All the rest, no. God makes it so accessible. He says, look and live. A person barely conscious can do that. Look and live. But you know what? It took two things, humility and faith. See, it's so simple that some people won't do it. They won't do it. Oh, it's got to be, uh, don't I have to do something? No, he did everything. And so you see the wages of sin, death. The free gift of God, life. The gospel woven right into the Jewish scripture. And Jesus talks about it here. How could looking at a snake on a pole save anyone from a snake bite? Well, it did. And how can looking to Jesus on a cross save a person? Well, it does. And it did in my life. And I want to close with a story just for us to think about something. And it was when I was a teenager. And I was going with a group of friends to Arizona. Now, Arizona is a desert place. If you've never been there, it's beautiful in a way. But it's a very harsh environment too. And there were some sand dunes there. And so early in the morning, we were there. And 
the sand was very wet. And some of us started digging some tunnels. Now, again, I don't want you to picture these little holes, you know, and stuff. We're talking deep, elaborate things that went through these sand dunes, actually connected through the peak of the sand dune in some places and stuff like that. We were just playing around just like kids do, you know, teenagers. We were young and dumb, as they say. Sometimes now I'm just old and dumb. But what we didn't realize is the sun was drying the sand. And suddenly as we were there, this group of friends and I, with a deep thud, the whole thing collapsed. <laughs> with one person missing. There was one of us still down deep in it. His name was Tim. We couldn't see him. We couldn't hear him. We didn't even know exactly where he was, but we knew he was no longer on the dunes. He was somewhere in that thing. And we had a general idea of where he was. And we only knew that he was somewhere under that sand and he only had a few minutes, if that, to live. And so we did what we could do. We dug and we called out to him and we called for help. And some people, uh, some people panicked. Some people just ran around screaming, ah, you know, he's dead, he's gone, all this kind of stuff. You've been there maybe in those panic situations. And some people dig and some people, you know, freak out. And so what happened is we're going through this. Some people ran to the ranger station, which was a little while away. And you know what? Those minutes that went by, they were like hours. And somebody finally found a finger, just a, a, the very tip of a finger coming up. And as we're digging in that area, all of a sudden, all of us digging in that area, as there's that little bit of hope, we found not only the finger, but the hand attached to it and the arm at a really weird angle. And so what was happening is that arm wasn't moving. There was no response at all. And so we dug down just even more madly at that point. We realized that we were maybe already too late. It had been about four minutes, we don't even know, since the collapse. And so when we pulled him out, he was face down. Tim was face down. And we turned him over. We turned him over. And I can only say that I have stared death in the face at that moment. I, I know exactly what it looks like to look at one of your friends and not have an ounce of life in them anymore. And uh, he had blue lips, and he just had these eyes that were glazed totally over and sand in them and no breath at all, no movement at all. And, you know, we didn't even have a moment to, to wonder what should we do when Tim coughed and spewed some sand, a little bit of sand out of his mouth and kind of convulsed, and there was just a little tremor and a little bit of breath. Now, right at that moment, the park rangers ran up, and they put him on a sled, and they got him out of there, got him to a hospital and everything else, and I'm glad to tell you that Tim lived. Now, he just barely did, though, and the doctors even said, listen, it could have gone the other way. It could have ended differently. And Tim told us later, I mean, right, you know, we were just teenagers at the time, but I'll never forget this. I mean, I... It had a profound effect on me. He told us later, listen, I couldn't move. I felt like a weight of the entire world was on me. I couldn't even expand my lungs one bit. I never felt anything like it. I was like bursting. And at the same time, I felt like I was drowning in sand. And he said, you know what? In that moment, they say your, eyes, your life flashes. He said, certainly mine did. And this is what flashed my friends and my family, and I had a picture of my parents, and I had a picture of my brother, who was one of the guys up on the top of the dune during that time. And he was just saying, man, I just don't want to die. I don't want to break these people's heart. I don't want this to happen. I don't want it to go this way. And he said, somehow, I could just barely hear muffled voices yelling, Tim. I mean, I, I, somehow, I don't know if I really heard it, or I thought I heard it, or whatever else, but I wanted to live, and I wanted to see the light again. And that story right there will point to what every expert on survival will tell you, which is, hey, it's not always about skill. Sometimes it's just about will. It's just about will, a will to live, a desire, a drive to survive. And people who are willing, because of that will, to dig until they find you, and people who are willing to stay alive until they're found somehow. Someone who will go on and will and will and will. And you think about this. Hey, Jesus is willing. That's one thing you know. Salvation happens at the intersection of two wills. And Jesus says, I will. Do you will? And some of you, frankly, you're buried. I mean, if, if the truth be known, the weight of the world on you. And it's just like that. Building your life on the sand, as Jesus said, instead of on the rock. And whether you're building big sand castles or sand caves, you know, they have a way of collapsing when you least expect it. 
And I, I love to think of it this way. Jesus didn't just dig for me. He died for me. He actually was willing to take my place and to be that snake on the pole for my sin. And so what's great is the same solution that's true of Christians, of how we get out of the wasteland and into the promised land. It's also the way that you get out of Egypt in the first place, which is what? You talk to the rock. You take the highway, the king's highway, the one way that there is. And you know what you do? You look and live. It's that simple. Now, what I want to do is just take a moment here in this room. If there's anybody here tonight who knows deep down, hey, I've never done that. I've never looked and lived. See, nobody else can look for you. Nobody else can do it. I, I wish I could look at the snake on the pole or Jesus on the cross and save everybody else. But guess what? Every one of us has been bitten. That's what it says in the Bible. We've all been bitten, and we all must make that decision individually to do it. So what I'm going to do is just ask us to bow our heads, close our eyes, and just take this moment here. If you want to acknowledge, hey, I am dry. I am hungry. I am empty. I have needs. I am in need of the solution to my sin, the solution to my problems. I'm not surviving. I'm not thriving. I need Jesus in my life. If that's you, all you need to do is raise your hand and I'll pray a prayer with you. I'll talk to the rock with you. It's just a simple prayer, inviting him into your life. Anybody here who hasn't done that need to do it tonight? I see you here in the front. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? want to say, Lord, I need you. I need to look and live. It's so simple and yet so profound. Anybody else here tonight? I see you here in the front. For those of you who raised your hand, we're going to have a song of invitation. But before we do that, I just want to take a moment and pray with you. The words are mine, but I pray they reflect your heart. And they certainly reflect the love that God has for you. Pray this prayer with me, those of you who raised your hand. God, I thank you that you sent your son to die for me, to take my place on the pole. And God, as I look and live here tonight, I just want to put my faith in you and follow after you this day and forever. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Give me new life, eternal life, abundant life. And Lord, even if I need to walk through some wilderness or some dry desert, Lord, I thank you that I'll walk that with you, that I can talk to the rock along the way and have every need met. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you who made that.